my name is Sue Rowley and I'm an archaeologist and an anthropologist. I work at the Museum of Anthropology out at UBC and in the Department of Anthropology and for the Lab of Archaeology out at UBC uh, as well. And my training is, in a, is as an archaeologist and when I was quite young, my father worked for the Indian Affairs and Northern Development, uh, the federal government, and when I was uh, 16, um, a Roman Catholic priest called Atata Marie, or Father Guy Marie Rousselier, uh, who lived in uh, what is now Mittimatelik, or Pond Inlet at the time, uh, to use its uh, English name, uh, was visiting the house and um, my parents said, my father said, well, do you need any help this summer? And he, uh, he said, sure. So I went up north when I was 16 and uh, really fell in love with the North. I'd always intended to be an archeologist, but I had dreams, I think like so many kids do, of Egypt and ancient Greece and ancient Rome, all the, that sort of massive built heritage. And I'd never really thought about uh, indigenous communities in, in Canada and working with them. Uh, but it was just such an amazing opportunity to work there and to look and to really think about and try to understand uh, the deep history of Inuit, going back thousands of years, back to what archaeologists refer to as independence culture, which is about 4,500 years ago. So this really amazing time depth of people and the way that they were able to survive in the North. And, you know, we read so much about the North and it's always phrased as, the North is a harsh environment. But the North is home. And so trying to understand the North as home as uh, somewhere that people call Nunatsia, the beautiful land. That's uh, what really intrigued me. And so I really fell in love with the land, the people, and the light in the north, which is very much, if you've ever, if you've ever been to the prairies or somewhere like that that has no trees, which people refer to as big sky country, it's very much that big sky country. And then the remarkable record of human habitation there. And this piece that we're going to look at speaks about human habitation in the north in so many different ways. So why don't we have a look at that and maybe Duncan you can come and help me pick up this piece. Because we're going to try and set it up. So why are you putting gloves? We're putting on gloves because uh, I work, um, I'm a museum professional and uh, by handling things we can potentially cause damage. So we want to always minimize the amount of damage that we cause. And so therefore we want to avoid the transference of oils and other things from our hand onto pieces. Uh, the, at the Museum of Anthropology, uh, indigenous peoples of course are free to handle and touch, but for someone like myself, it's not part of my heritage, it's not part of my culture. I'm really more uh, in acting in a custodial kind of manner for this. This is part of the journey of this piece, which will continue and who knows how it will develop over time. So I'm just one, one part of that journey and therefore my role is to try to cause as little harm as possible in my handling of the piece. So that's why, why I wear gloves. Do you wear, why do you wear gloves? <laughs> I would say the, the same reasons as, okay. as you do. <laughs> right. So we're going to come over here, and we don't know how this weighs, that so we haven't uh, looked at it before. We really want to ensure that we do this in a good way, so we're actually going to move this back a bit because I'm going to stay here. And we're just going to both pick it up gently and try to tip it forward so that it rests on the foam, and then you can see it. There we go. And it's quite, yes. Yep, it looks like it's quite stable. Stable. Okay, so we may we'll leave it here for a little bit so that I can just talk about uh, this piece and you can have a look at it. This uh, remarkable piece is by Tommy Asherak, an Inuk um, from uh, Taloyoak, uh, uh, previously known in English as uh, Spence Bay. And what he's carved this out of is out of one of the massive bones of a bowhead whale. And I'll talk a little bit later about bowhead whales and the critical importance of bowhead whales. But I thought I'd just give you a little bit about this piece and the iconography, what you can see and read and understand about this piece. When I was thinking about this piece, I was thinking one of the things that it shows you is the really deep respect that hunting cultures have for the animals whose lives they take. That they so much understand that they're 
by taking a life, a life is being given to them. And this piece here is an angachok, who is a spiritual leader, sometimes uh, translated into English as shaman. And he is in the act of transforming into a walrus. An angachok is someone who can see those invisible worlds that most of us don't have the eye to see, that just we're, we're not able to, to experience that. But the angachok in this in this instance, a man can see those that spiritual realm. And part of the Angakok's role is to redress the balance in the world. So uh, for Inuit, the world is held in a very delicate balance, and the actions of human beings can actually cause that balance to go awry. And it is the role of the Angakok to make everything go back. And one of the ways that an angakok does this uh, is to transform into a sea creature and go down into the depths of the sea and work with uh, Nuli Ayok, who's, one of the, who's a, uh, a woman transformed, who uh, controls access to sea mammals. And so he goes down and he talks about how people have behaved and how they didn't mean to behave in that way that they, are, um, they recognize their transgressions and then he convinces her to allow the animals to resurface and to gift themselves to people. So that's what's being captured here, this act of the transformation of the angakok into his walrus being. And you can see that very clearly with the two tusks coming down here. Right? And so that also speaks to us about the culture and spirituality of people, uh, of Inuit, uh, prior to, and their ongoing belief systems, but prior to the introduction of Christianity uh, into the region, which worked to uh, take away power from the Anglo, to change, to try and do what so much of colonization uh, tries to do, which is to transform people from their own vision of who they are into somebody else's vision of who they ought to be. So that's what, you, so that also is contained um, within this piece because it was created uh, we don't actually know the exact creation date for this piece, but we're going to guess somewhere probably in the 60s, early 70s. Uh, so it was created at a time when that transformation from the prior belief system into Christianity had taken quite firm root, but in a way that really syncretized the, the two to some degree. So that's part of what you also see within this carving. So that's the carving. Yeah, and then I think probably for its safety we should put it down. And then we can talk about whales if you like. Is that good? Okay. All right. So there we go. So we'll just rest it down gently there. Okay. And how do you acquire this knowledge about, first of all, the language? Because you just mentioned a few uh, Inuit names, mm -hmm. right? And mythology and cosmogony mm -hmm. and uh, shape-shifting. Mm -hmm. And so, have you been working with Inuits? Ah, oh, that's a great question, and I should have answered that right off the start. So, uh, as I said, I was very fortunate when I was 16 to head up to the north, and I was working with a number of Inuit uh, that summer, and then I continued to work with uh, Inuit, and in fact, my I had to change my, my thesis topic, but my original PhD thesis topic was on oral history, of uh, a group called the Tunit or Tunitjua, who are the people who uh, Inuit say lived in the land before they came. Uh, and they have many histories about these people, and I was really fascinated to understand more. So in fact, I went out and I interviewed and worked with a number of elders, uh, particularly in uh, the area of Baffin Island, talking to people there about their histories of uh, Inuit. And so that, that intersection between what um, people view as archaeology, that work of, of very painstakingly digging through the dirt to uncover the pieces that people have left behind, um, and bringing that together with the oral history, the way that people understand uh, their past was something that I was really passionate about and something that I've been able to, to continue working on. So that's 
that's part of uh, where that knowledge came from. It's through the very generous uh, sharing of knowledge from Inuit uh, community members who uh, really took great care of me in so many different in so many different ways from being absolutely appalled once that I was out on an island all by myself and why wasn't there anybody else there with me uh, that's a very dangerous situation you should never put yourself in that situation in the Arctic um, and uh, so they would come out every day by boat and it took me a little while to understand what was going on but all of a sudden all these people were coming and showing interest in the work that I was doing and Thought that's really fascinating, but it turned out later that yes, of course, they were interested in what I was doing, why I was there, who I was, but they also really were worried, genuinely worried about me, and felt that I was in their territory, in their land, and that they therefore had a duty of care to make sure that nothing happened uh, to me while I was there. And then throughout time, uh, the way that Community members with their knowledge and expertise have really transformed the way that I think about uh, the past. Uh, to give you an example, I was uh, with a colleague of mine, Carolyn McDonald. We ran a field school for Inuit youth, an archaeology field school. And we had elders who would come and they would interpret the finds and the knowledge that they had, their visual knowledge and understanding of things was just at a level that, that I hadn't, I couldn't compare at all. I just didn't have that level of knowledge. So from uh, finding a particular harpoon head that was four and a half thousand years old, and me looking at it and going, well, that's really interesting. It's a different style of harpoon head. And having an elder look at it and go, oh, look at that, the line hole. That's too small a line hole for a skin thong. It could only have been used with braided sinew. Well, that's a level of knowledge and understanding that's, that's truly remarkable. So those kinds of, you could almost call them small interactions, uh, really made me think about things in a different way. You think about the expertise of community members and what they bring to uh, the, the understanding of their own history, um, not, uh, both through the oral histories and also through the findings that come out of excavations. So, and then this guy, he's out of whalebone. And the whalebone that he's out of, I don't know about this specific piece, but I can tell you that many pieces of beautiful carved whalebone like this from the Arctic actually come from ancient houses. They come from the houses of, of people that archaeologists refer to as the Thule culture, but are the direct ancestors of contemporary Inuit, who were both whale hunters. And one of the uh, amazing things, of course, about uh, bowhead whales is the huge size of their bones. And so people built uh, semi constructed semi subterranean houses that you would enter in through a really ingenious system called a cold trap. Have you? This is where you're higher, then you come down and go in, so you're not bringing the cold from outside into your home. So uh, that system, and then it's built out of rocks and stone and sod. But the roof beams are constructed out of things like the ribs and jaws of these giant bowhead whales. So these, uh, and the reason that I'm saying that I that many of these come out of uh, these ancient houses is we know that for a fact because we know artists talk about removing from some of these ancient uh, sites. But we also can look at the porosity of this bone, and you're, you can't probably see it from where you are, but it's very dry and it's very gray. And whale bone. Uh, if you actually had a fresh whale bone, it would be full of fat. And it would be very greasy and oily. And so you, uh, it's actually very difficult to use and you, you don't actually carve a fresh bone like this. You would always leave it to, to bleach. Uh, so that's what's happened to this. And so it's probably bleached within the context of being, because it's such a big, beautiful piece, a part of the structure of an old house that was then taken and used for that. So that speaks to 
that connection to the older uh, culture. And then you're like, well, why would somebody take this and transform it into this piece? And that's a great part of the colonial history. So uh, in the North, um, the Canadian government, particularly after the Second World War, was looking for ways to bring Inuit into a cash economy. And one, they tried all kinds of different uh, things. So it, they tried uh, canning Arctic char, which is a fish. But of course, fish grow quite slowly in the north. And often, so that's not actually a sustainable thing. So another thing that uh, came about in the early 50s, Inuit had always had a tradition of carving. And when the first, when Europeans first started going to the north, they started bringing back wanting souvenirs to take home. Uh, even some of the quite early um, British uh, voyages in the early 1800s were asking for little model kayaks by like home. So people already were making things like that. So one of the things that came about in the early 50s was the creation of an art market. So people were looking for things that could be uh, sold down south and across the north. And it's still an, it's an incredibly important part of the economy of Nunavut today. Uh, so that's where that comes from. It comes from that uh, that uh, desire to bring Inuit into a, a cash economy on the part of a government, and then the artistic uh, ability of so many creativity of so many Inuit who were able to see things. You know, think about you take a whalebone like this. I when I look at a whalebone, I don't see a shaman transforming and an angakok transforming in the whalebone. But Tommy Ashabak saw that in this piece and then was able to realize it and then share it. So what he got from the creation of this piece is he got the, the pleasure and the joy of the creation, but he did never kept this. This then went immediately into a system that would have taken it down to a southern art market. So it also speaks to me of that part of of uh, the colonial system. To backtrack a bit, it also speaks about the almost extinction and loss of the bowhead whales. Because uh, Inuit hunted bowhead whales. But the Inuit population was relatively small, and a bowhead whale is a huge animal and can feed people for a very long time. But the European desire for bowhead was huge, particularly for the oil. And so um, you have uh, starting, I guess, around, I, I probably am going to mess up on some of these dates, but it's quite early. It's the 12, 1300s off the north coast of Spain. You get the Basque whalers bringing in a lot of uh, whale. whale oil from that area. Uh, it's hard for people, I think, today to think of whales off the coast, south coast of France and north coast of Spain. Um, and then uh, in the 1500s, you get the Basque whalers off the coast of late 15, early 1600s, off the coast of Labrador, and up into Spitsbergen in northern, what is now northern Europe. Uh, and then uh, beginning in the mm, about 1820s, you get whalers, uh, both Scottish, English, and American, into what is now Nunavut, into the area of the east coast of Baffin Island and then over into the, into the Hudson's Bay area by the 1860s and the same for the western part um, in the area around the Mackenzie Delta. And there were ship after ship after ship that came in and really their function was to kill as many whales as they possibly could to make as much money. Uh, and that thought of that venture of making money was throughout the entire crew from the owner of the ships back in Scotland or England or the United States uh, to the crew members who all got paid shares. So they had a small salary but then they got paid in shares. So of course the more whales you took in, the higher ever your share, the better that you did. The better able you were to support your family uh, back in whatever country uh, they were living in. So it also this so therefore this piece also speaks to globalization 
to that way that resources are extracted from all across the world to feed other parts of the world with what they're looking for. And particularly in the Arctic, um, the bowhead is one of the sort of indicator species of the, just exactly how much damage can be done, how quickly. Because people were going in taking out large numbers of ships were going in taking out large numbers of, uh, of bowheads and from about the 1820s, but really by the early 1900s, that was really gone. And I think the last whaling station closed down in the early, I'm going to say around, I think, the early 1920s, 30s. But because by that time there weren't whales left. And it's only recently that uh, you have been permitted to hunt bullheads. So imagine, this is your home. You've been hunting bullheads sustainably for generations. And all of a sudden, another culture comes in, wipes out the species, and then tells you you can't hunt them anymore. So now the now they're back to a number whereby contemporary Inuit in Nunavut are able to uh, hunt. They have a quota system. There are many um, the odd bowhead around for community, for cultural practice, for, for sharing. So. Um, Again, systems are changing all the time, but then the bowheads are coming back, which is the most important thing. Yeah. I was wondering about the terminology mm -hmm. regarding Inuits, mm -hmm. Indigenous Aboriginal First Nations. Okay. So, wow. because here we're sure. in Canada, so yes. mm -hmm. what does this all mean? Okay. So in Canada, it's a that's a great question. Um, in Canada, we use the term um, Indigenous to refer to all of the Indigenous peoples of Canada, and that's inclusive of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. So that's really how things are, are broken down. So the Inuit are the, are the peoples of the north, um, of Newfoundland, Labrador, Nunavik, which is northern Quebec, or Nunatsiavut, Nunavik, Nunavut, and the, the western regions. So, uh, and then of course into Alaska, across Alaska, and into Siberia as well. And there's a, an amazing organization called the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, and they uh, speak for all uh, Inuit. So they work with the Inuit from the different nations to try to ensure uh, that their rights are understood and met. Uh, so, uh, so in Canada, First Nations. Um, doesn't refer to Inuit. But the other term that people sometimes use in Canada is First Peoples. And that again is the inclusive term that will refer to uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Close enough now? Yeah. Okay. So this piece is by Fabian Ovar from Kugarok. And when I first saw it, I think I was a bit surprised because uh, Kugarok is not well known for its walrus herds. Uh, and it turns out that uh, this was from a walrus that was actually hunted uh, uh, um, in Broughton Island. Uh, on the east coast of Baffin Island and then sent over to have Fabian do this magnificent carving with it. So there's all sorts of things happening uh, with this carving. Uh, he's put a lot of detail into it. So uh, one of the things that's immediately obvious is the way that he's cut up. This is the, this is the anatomical skull of a walrus with the tusks in the sockets that are the actual sockets for the, for the walrus tusks. Uh, and then he's cut pieces off here and he's cut the back of the walrus skull off here. And he's then looked at it and seen a human face. And so he's taken the, created the eyes here and then you can see the nose and the mouth that there's the rest of the person that is right there for you. And then he said, well, what can I really tell you about Inuit life? 
And so he's put on it two dwellings. So uh, there were many, many different styles of architecture in the Arctic. People tend to think of the snow house as the only style of architecture in the Arctic, but for much of the year, there isn't snow for making a snow house. So a uh, snow house is one, and that's what he's created right here. This circle, the, the semicircle here, this is a snow house that he's created on the side here. This is a kind of dwelling that you use in the winter time if you live in an area with the right snow conditions. Uh, we also were looking earlier at the whalebone piece and that's uh, a semi-subterranean house built with whale bones and stone. There are also houses built uh, with pillars of, uh, with uh, stacks of rocks with moss and double uh, tents for fall and fall, for fall occupation. And then on the other side here, and I'm just going to turn this slightly so that you can actually see it maybe, uh, is the uh, tent. And this is a summer tent here. And if you look very carefully at it here, you can see how he's done this etching here. And you might think, what are those strange lines? Well, the tent is made out of seal skins. And so what he's actually shown you here in this are the seal skins that are patched together to make the tent. And the tent would have in many areas of the north, um, as you know, it's 24 hour daylight in the north uh, in the summertime in uh, north of the Arctic Circle. And it's, uh, and you need to adjust to that. And one of the ways that you can do that in your tent construction is that you can, on the back half of the tent, where your sleeping area is, you leave the hair on the seal skin, and that then creates a dark area. And then on the front, you actually scrape the hair off the skin and have a thinner skin, and that creates translucency that lets light into the front half of your tent. So you can create a darker space uh, for sleeping in, because I don't know if you've ever tried to sleep uh, where it's 24 hour light, but it's actually quite challenging. Um, and your body just rhythm just changes and you actually need less sleep, but you still need some. So then he's continued up to work on the tusks themselves. And tell me if this is in the right space for you to see, if you can see up on the tusks. So you can see that then he's drawn all sorts of animals and human beings on the tusks, doing different things. So here he has a pair of human beings and here he has two owls facing each other. Uh, but up here, here's a hunter. And here he is, he's getting ready to throw his harpoon. Then we have here um, dogs running. And here we have a polar bear standing. And then here we have, a, I can't tell, I think it's a seal. And then all the way along here, can you see this right here? This scene right here? Yeah. It's quite faint now. Somebody's clearly rubbed their hands along this tusk. It's one of the things that people love to do with tusks, ivory wal walrus tusks. They feel so smooth. Um, this is a, a man uh, on his kamutik, his sled. And the runners for the sleds in the past often were made out of whalebone. Now they're um, usually made out of uh, wood. Uh, and again, the runners on the past uh, would have been covered in, in mud. And then a thin layer of ice would have been put on and polished with a sh piece of polar bear skin to a high sheen to allow them to sm glide smoothly. And then here you have the dog. And he's only drawn one dog here, but you could have a number of dogs uh, that is then pulling the kamutik, and you can see that he's got something on it. It's just very faint, the traces of that here. And then here you see beluga whales, and you see uh, another seals, and you see a uh, fish right at the very end of the tusks here. And then up here, you see a snow house. This is terribly faint. It's very hard to see, but you can see the snow house with its entrance right here and a woman standing in front of the snow house waiting outside, possibly to go into the snow house. So he's decorated both of these tusks all the way around with the different animals. So we've seen some of them. Should I turn it around for you to see more? Let's turn this around. All right. 
So, and you can see he's used two different techniques here. He's, uh, he's created a bar relief up here, and then he's also done incised uh, work here that he has then put something, some form of black in to allow it, the, the design to pop so that we see it. So here we have another animal that we haven't talked about yet. These are muskoxen. Uh, and then we have caribou and more birds. So you can see he's really, really tried in this scene to really give you a complete sense of, uh, or not a complete sense, but a, a real opportunity to look and see at some of the, the wildlife, some of the animals that inhabit the same space um, as he does, to even some of the smaller animals like this Arctic hare right here. this is again one of the things we were talking earlier about the issue of the contemporary uh, carvings and um, the, the global market for Inuit art and the fact that it's becoming more and more challenging um, for Inuit artists to find a, a market that will allow um, walrus ivory to cross borders in the same way that people are worried um, about um, Elephants, uh, walrus are not in the same uh, endangered status at all as elephants, but um, again, it's one of those protective measures that people are, are taking on board. Walrus are such an amazing species. Um, this is, these are the tusks of a, this is a, a male walrus. Um, and the male walrus, uh, when they're in herds, they eat, as do the rest of the walrus, they generally eat clams that are on the bottom, so they go down and root around with their tusks and then suck up the, the clams. And um, so walrus meat is something that people have to be careful with eating. They need to cook it quite thoroughly. Uh, but another, um, there are delicacies that people eat, and some of that are the clams that walrus also eat or, or a, are considered a delicacy. Um, but occasionally you get a, a male walrus that is by itself that goes rogue. And they turn into seal eaters. And they can be, um, walrus can be very protective of their herds, but a lone male walrus by itself who eats uh, seal is a particularly dangerous um, animal. And the very first time I ever went up to the Arctic, uh, we were camping and uh, the uh, Inuit who were camping with us uh, went out in their um, outboard canoe, which is about a 26-foot freighter canoe with an outboard engine on the back of it. So it's just an open canoe. It's not a, a, a major watercraft. And uh, they were gone for hours, and they came back, and we said, have you had any luck looking at anything? They said, no, but we ran into this male walrus. It was one of these rogue walruses, and the back of the canoe had two tusk marks running down the back of the canoe from where this walrus had just attacked uh, the canoe. So people will talk about the agility that you need to hunt um, walrus and imagine, because in a canoe with an outboard, think about escaping from the walrus. You can go into reverse, you can go quite fast, but think about if you were in a kayak, right? And people talk about hunting walrus in kayak, and to me that's always like one of those amazing feats that people were able to uh, hunt uh, these massive animals um, successfully uh, when they have these tusks on them that they can then use to rip holes, especially in something like a kayak, which is just skins around a frame. So that's really a little bit about this piece. So what we have here are two Inuit dolls uh, made at slightly different time periods and they really speak to the uh, work of Inuit seamstresses. So this one here, the taller one, uh, this, is, uh, this doll is from Sanyakayak and unfortunately what happened is what often happens that uh, the name of um, 
the creators of things like these beautiful Inuit dolls never get recorded. So we don't unfortunately know who, who made this doll, but um, she is wearing a sealskin outfit. Uh, and this is very classically a summer clothing that people wear. And we can tell it's a, that this is a woman with from a number of uh, reasons, but merely by looking at her clothing, you can see the lines across her boot are, are horizontal like this along the bottom of the boots here. And that is something that was done for women. Men's were vertical. Uh, we also see the slightly pouched pockets. Another thing we see in clothing is a stylistic variation across the north so that people, when they uh, met people or saw people coming from a distance, they could tell if they were people from their region or from somewhere else merely by looking at the style of clothing that they were wearing long before they could see their faces and figure out their relationships uh, with those people. So the region of Senarayak had sometimes these uh, large, um, po almost pockets here. Sometimes they come down and they're quite, they almost stick out just like a pocket where somebody could keep something in, so it was used that way. And often these, uh, these big shoulders, uh, sort of like almost like a padded shoulder kind of uh, design um, to them. This woman has uh, tattoos on her, and you can see on her face here, you can see that uh, the, the mouth and things have been sewn. But in addition, you can also see the tattoo lines uh, that are on her face, and you can also see uh, tattoo lines on her, I'm just going to turn her slightly, sorry dear. Uh, you can see tattoo lines on the backs of her hands, just here. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to point out about uh, Inuit clothing before is, and you'll see this when I move to this next one, is you might wonder about her age. And I'm going to tell you that this is an older woman. And that has to do with her clothing because so I mentioned we have different materials for different seasons of the year, seal skin in the summer, caribou skin in the winter. Uh, we have um, different styles for different regions. We also have different styles or different ways that uh, um, uh, clothing is constructed, uh, depending on whether you're male or female, and different ways that clothing is constructed depending on how old you are. So this is an older woman's uh, piece of clothing and I'm just going to show you the back and then I'll explain with the other doll why this is an older woman's piece of clothing. So I want you just to look at this and see the straightness of the back here. Okay, so th that's, this is a beautiful doll. So. And then this doll here she is from uh, uh, Taloyoak, so she's from a little bit further west in Nunavut than the first doll. And perhaps the first thing that you're going to notice about her is that she isn't wearing seal skin or caribou skin. She's actually wearing uh, um, western cloth clothing. And underneath here, she has um, an under parka or an amauti. This parka that women wear is called an amauti. And underneath here you have the red duffel. And this then on the outside, this is a Grenfell cloth. So the, this one provides warmth in the summer and this one provides a bit of windproof, windproofing uh, to it. Um, and then I'm going to turn her around and I'm going to show you this is the amauti of a woman of child rearing age. Uh, and you can see that because if we look at her back here, you can probably see that the back is quite different from the back of the other doll. It actually pouches out. And this is the pouch when people talk about Inuit wearing babies in their hoods. It's actually not in their hoods. It's actually on in this pouch. So the infant or the young child would sit in the back here with the legs spread out here, facing forwards, not backwards. And you can see that this string that comes around here and lashes through here, this actually helps to keep the baby in place. 
so that the baby isn't going to fall out the backside. Um, and then the baby's head is able to come up through here. This keeps the, the child incredibly warm because the child is right next to the mother's skin. So right, right next, so that sense of proximity between parent, mother and child is there right next. And then along the child's back, there's one duffel and fabric, then the, both sides of the hood. So there's actually six layers of cloth on the back of the child. So you get this amazing protection that's happening um, for uh, infants. This is actually, we can even go further and say, this is the, um, this is the, the pouch. This is the amalti for a slightly older child. This is not for a newborn infant. The newborn infant ones tend to be even smaller at the back uh, and hold them very close. So it really shows you, I hope you can see some of the incredible differences uh, in clothing that you see here. And then this is very classically um, of the style of Taloyuak with the, with the bit coming down here. Um, and it may in fact be that this is someone, Taloyuak had people from, who moved over from um, uh, Cape Dorset into the Taloyuak region. And this is, when I look at this Amauti, I look at it and I think possibly this is someone who is whose relatives moved from Cape Dorset to Taloyuak because of the style that we're looking at here. And then the fur around here. And the ruffs along here were quite often made of uh, wolverine um, because they didn't frost up in the winter time so that your hood actually didn't cause frost around your face. And uh, dolls like this, um, these are not the dolls that were made as playthings for young children. These are dolls that were made um, for uh, sale to outsiders. Uh, the dolls that were made for young uh, youngsters to play with frequently didn't have a face on them and quite often it was uh, a young girl learning to sew who was making the clothing for her doll. So that was part of her learning all the intricacies, all the stitches, everything that you need using small scraps from the, the work that her mothers and aunties and granny uh, were using in the house. The dolls that young girls played with had these important roles, right? Of they were their, they were their uh, playthings, but they were also amazing teaching um, things. So that when um, a mother might be making a large pair of boots for someone to wear, um, her daughter or another young woman in the household would be learning to make a very small pair of boots uh, for um, for a play doll and then transforming that in later on in life, that set of skills into making larger pieces, into making the full size boots that she would need to make, kamiks that she would need to make uh, every season of the year. And just as with the clothing styles, neither of these boots talk much about style other than the, the women's uh, identifier of women um, here, but there are all kinds of different styles of boots and skins that you wear and prepare in different um, ways for the different seasons of the year and for the different activities uh, that someone's going to be undertaking. Because you can imagine that um, someone going out and standing uh, at a seal breathing hole for a number of hours waiting for a seal to come up uh, needs a pair of boots that are gonna keep their feet warm even when they're not able to move, because of course, a lot of us like to stomp our feet to get warm when we're cold, but if you were stomping your feet above a seal breathing hole, you're actually telegraphing to the seal that something is happening on top of the ice. So you have to actually stand still. Um, and so uh, there's very special ways that those boots are constructed and quite often have um, sometimes have a polar bear skin pads on the bottom to again keep your feet soft and light and keep your feet warm. Um, whereas if you are at home looking after the young people tending the, a lamp, um, then you don't need 
the same kind of boots. You don't need necessarily your boots to be fully waterproof, but if you're out uh, jumping in and out of kayaks, then you do need your boots to be waterproof. So there's all kinds of very um, special detailed knowledge. There are also many, many uh, histories that people tell about the importance of stitch work and how critical to survival stitch work is. And so uh, in almost every community, someone will tell a history of people who got caught out in the ice. So if people are, are, were out in the past or even today, if people are out and they're out along what's called the flow edge, the flow edge is where the water is open and then the flow edge is what's still attached to the land. So that's the land fast ice. But of course, if, if there's winds, if there's waves, if something happens, bits of the flow edge can break off. And depending on the wind and the currents and the tide at the time, people will get pulled out. Uh, and that's a very dangerous situation to be in, right? Because it can happen really quickly and you can't jump over the gap. You can't, it's too far for you to get back. So uh, people will tell these histories of people who got caught out and the stitch work wasn't good enough on their garments so they got frostbite versus people whose stitch work was, women whose stitch work was so fine and so well done that people never would, didn't get frostbite when they got caught up in these really dangerous situations that could be the difference between uh, life and death. Nowadays, you will uh, rarely see people wearing sealskin. Um, in the winter time, you'll quite often see people wearing caribou uh, because there's still nothing that's better than caribou. For the winter weather, the caribou have hollow hairs in their skins. And so uh, wearing a double layer of caribou skin where you wear the first layer of caribou skin, the hair of the caribou rests against your body and then the outer layer of the caribou skin is outside. So you have this double insulation layer that just like keeps people toasty, toasty warm, even when it's very cold outside. So today when people are um, riding around in skidoos and snowmobiles, you, you will quite often see people who can still have caribou skin clothing. But it, uh, most of the time you'll see people wearing clothing more along the lines of this doll uh, here or the standard kind of clothing that everybody else wears today. Um, the, 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 the down parkas that come from the south or that people in the north are now using down up there and making uh, parkas in the same way with the cells and things that are made down here. So those are those two dolls.